It's February 2018. I sit in a white lawn chair with an empty bucket, a jug of water, and a view of the ocean. A shaman burns seven marks on my calf and sprays the venom of a poisonous frog into my skin. My husband sits next to me while the same shaman burns seven marks on his right arm. Ten minutes later, I'm chugging three gallons of water and vomiting between gulps. Outside of the tribal chants encouraging us to puke our brains out, there are no words among the five participants. The jungle topography becomes something too far away to comprehend. The frog poison runs through me like the last shot of tequila I know I did not need. If I don't drink water, death is not out of the question. Speaking of questions, a loud one bubbles up in my mind. What the fuck am I doing? <laughs> I'm here because my bosses, Daryl and Linda, invited me. When they ask me to do something, I do it. Behind my white lawn chair of terror, Linda encourages my water consumption. My stomach flips. Oh, shit. I grab my bucket and run to the bathroom, my butt cheeks squeezing tight. The medicine's called Combo, and there are no hallucinogenic effects. Absolutely nothing fun about it. My bosses believe in the healing powers of this frog poison. They disapprove of anyone who is not strong enough to drink water and get through the pain. I met Daryl and Linda when I was 20, while sipping a margarita with a fake ID and terribly bleached blonde hair at the old El Camino in North Park. <laughs> Shout out. They were my older sister's friends, and when I first got to know them, my impressionable 20-year-old self was in awe of how cool they were for being in their 40s. They didn't dress like the soccer moms and dads. They partied as hard as I did in college, and plus they had a level of financial success that allowed them to travel, start their own business, and give a middle finger to the status quo. I liked them, and more importantly, I looked up to them. I wanted to understand how they got to be who they were at that age so I could emulate them. I'd grown up seeing my family struggle with money. When I was a kid, my mom always relied on my dad financially, so when he went bankrupt, so did our family. When I met Daryl and Linda, I was driven to change my financial future and I'd do whatever it took to be successful. I was in a vulnerable place when I met them. My mom had died a few years prior and my dad was freshly recovering from alcoholism which is why when I graduated from college in San Francisco a few years later, I said yes to managing their fitness studios there. For the first few months, everything went swimmingly. They were still living in San Diego full time, which meant I landed a job with autonomy, skipped the boring office jobs, and I said no to the law school debt that I was considering. I soon discovered that Daryl and Linda excelled at building a world of silent packs. They extended what they thought of as favors, and I owed them everything. Their MO was to invite me out for a night of partying and philosophical late night talks, my weak spot. <laughs> the next day, I'd get an aggressive hungover text asking me why I hadn't gotten their daughter's iPad fixed before they had to be on a flight I needed to drive them to. And mind you, I was not a nanny or personal assistant. I managed their fitness studios. Daryl began visiting San Francisco more regularly, and I saw a new side of him. In public, he was bubbly, kind, and warm. In private, he lashed out at people verbally, typically women, calling them cunts when they did not give him what he wanted, whether that be a discount in rent, a cut in line, or if they were just straight up physically unattractive to him. Soon, it was my turn. If I didn't bring the studio mail in on time or if I didn't respond to an email in the right way, he'd berate me with a stream of texts, asking what the hell was wrong with me. I was always on 24 seven with fitness classes starting at 6 a.m. and running until 9 p.m. every day. He was my mentor. And if I wanted to be like him, I had to take his criticisms to make something of myself. I didn't realize how his criticism fed a growing sense of self-hatred. All I knew was that I could never do enough, even though over the course of five years, I launched seven fitness studios and wore every hat imaginable. 
All they had to do was sit there and watch their bank accounts add up. And Linda prided herself on being self-made. And she rarely mentioned her rich uncle who gave her bundles of money and the privilege of such delusion. But I still wanted to be them because they symbolized success to me and they were shiny and bright in my time of vulnerability. When they went to Burning Man, they put feathers in their hair and I mirrored them with feathers in mine. I adopted mannerisms, adjusted my laugh, learned to meditate and burn frog poison into my skin, all to be someone worthy of their approval, like a dog who learned to heal for a treat. The boundaries between us dissolved further when Linda asked me to donate eggs so they could have a baby. They didn't force me into it. I wanted to help them conceive after seeing my sister go through the struggles of IVF unsuccessfully. They didn't offer me payment and I didn't want it. Looking back, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> it required giving myself injections, three plus months of nausea, and an invasive procedure to extract the eggs from my bloated ovaries. And in the end, the embryos failed to give a positive result for Linda. But after that, I felt closer to them than I ever had. Now my husband always thought the world of my intelligence. He never liked Daryl or Linda. We weren't yet married when I donated the eggs and he respected my decisions. But he told me later that he had plenty of reservations about my choice to go through with it. Still, he supported me in my work. He didn't see the internal terror Daryl's hourly texts were causing me, and I hid it behind my obsession with work. He's an artist himself, so obsession was something he could understand and even encouraged. Now, Linda always told me our relationship was so much more than business. But it seemed to me this philosophy only applied when it benefited them. So when I hinted at wanting to possibly change careers, they told me, it's really hard out there. You probably can't do anything better than this. And I believe them. When they offered me a managing partnership agreement to open up a fitness studio in Amsterdam, I jumped at the donut like I always had. I saw it as my next big step towards financial freedom. In San Francisco, I was paid as a freelancer with no health benefits. And in Amsterdam, I'd be paid half that and nothing more until the Amsterdam studio was profitable. Did I mention that both Daryl and Linda were formerly lawyers? Yeah. <laughs> I packed my bags and moved to Amsterdam with a supportive husband and a fat, lazy cat. Upon arrival, I refreshed my inbox to a stream of emails about how bad of a job I did at hiring my replacement in San Francisco. She's not ready, they told me, after I spent six months training her while they made profit without doing anything. What they meant to say was, this girl has boundaries and won't do everything we tell her. My first attempts at standing up to them with the security of over 5,000 miles between us failed. We fought over video chat and they threatened to take away the partnership if I didn't continue training my San Francisco replacement immediately. I mentioned the word manipulation to them because I felt they were ganging up on me while I was still jet lagged and hadn't even unpacked my boxes. They told me how ungrateful I was, how entitled I was to ask for a few days of rest. And I gave the new venture everything I had. I built an incredible team and friendships that were difficult to leave, but I couldn't shake the feeling that was starting to dawn on me. My relationship with Daryl and Linda was not good for me. I finally cracked when I got my wisdom teeth removed in the Netherlands. The oral surgeon deemed Americans weak-willed. I let him work on me anyway. Under fluorescent lights, he took out his bone saw and went straight for my nerve. My brain left my body as tears ran down my cheeks and blood pooled across my chin. He told me, don't be afraid of the pressure. As he cut open my bone, he exposed the realization that I was my own biggest bully. I'd been sabotaging myself from the inside out for years. And a familiar question shot through the pain, what the 
fuck are you doing? Why did I continue to do the things I knew were bad for me? Why did I continue to believe the toxic manipulators who didn't care about the pain they were causing me? I couldn't do it anymore. I told Daryl and Linda I did not want to open more studios and they made it clear it was not an option to keep my stake in the one I just built. I decided wiping my hands clean was payment enough. And yes, I still stayed in Europe during the pandemic and kept the studio afloat to save their financial investment. I spruced up my resume and had dozens of interviews. I faced plenty of rejection, self-doubt, and all the mean voices in my head until I didn't. I landed a remote marketing role that paid me six figures with full benefits and I cut off communication with Daryl and Linda my first day on the job after recognizing what true respect felt like from a boss. And I face pressure in my current role, but I don't have anyone whispering to me that I'm incapable along the way. My new boss invited me to a music festival with him and his wife and I politely declined. <laughs> And he respected my choice and that personal boundary that I set. And I still grapple with shame even after therapy and over a year of no contact with Daryl and Linda. And I was able to forgive them and now I'm working on forgiving myself, but it comes and it goes. I'm working on it. Daryl once told me I was not great at handling pressure when I had my first panic attack. He told me this while he was hung over after staying up all night doing cocaine in Colombia at a sexual intimacy workshop with other like-minded spiritual millionaires. <laughs> but who was I to judge? I was just an entitled millennial squeezing her butt cheeks on the way to the bathroom. Madison Ford, everybody. Addison Ford.